Hi everyone, welcome to Diabetes Prime Time. We are here tonight with Diabetes Care and Education Specialist, Kara Schrager, answering questions from people with type 2 diabetes about food and more. Before we get started, tell me in the comments where you're watching from and let me know if it's your first time joining us. Tonight's episode is brought to you by Diabetes On The Go, a super cool program where you can get a text message each week with helpful diabetes management tips, recipes, and more, all for free. Get the support and information you need. Just click on the link in the comments to learn more and sign up. Kara, thanks so much for being here with us tonight. Thank you so much for having me. I'd like to start out this episode with a question we received not too long ago from Jody, a person with type 2. She asks, looking online, I see mixed data on what I should eat and what I shouldn't. Will you send me a list of good and bad foods to eat on a type 2 diet? That's probably a question you get often. What would you say to Jody? I just want to acknowledge that there's a lot of information out there and it might it's totally normal to feel overwhelmed with what we should or should not eat for diabetes. And I want to answer the the good versus bad part in terms of I think it's important that we not label foods as being good or bad. It might be better to, that we think about it in terms of how does it impact our own individual blood sugar. And to do that, we just eat the particular food that's in question and check our blood sugar one to two hours later to determine, does that fit in our target range? And if so, then that's a perfectly fine choice for us. If it doesn't, then maybe there's a way that we can tweak it a little bit to either cut back on the amount or maybe choose to include other foods with it so that we don't have a, the same response on our blood sugar. So in general, when we check our blood sugar at one to two hours after a meal, what, what's the number we're looking for on our meter? So in general, the goal for one to two hours after a meal or snack is less than 180 milligrams per deciliter, give or take. And we should probably be talking to our doctor or our diabetes educator to make sure that that's the right number for us. Yes. So depending on, there are some instances where you might need to have a little bit of a tighter control. For example, if you are pregnant, um, you want to have your blood sugars be in a tighter control and you have different goals, or or maybe you are more sensitive to having low blood sugars and you would need a higher goal for after your meals, or, or if you're planning on doing some type of exercise after. So it is very um, situational. So I think in general, the goal is less than 180, but definitely talk to your diabetes educator, provider, what your specific goals are. So if we were going to lay out in broad strokes what the key element of a healthy diet are, what would you say they would be? The key elements of a healthy diet would be one that includes variety, so eating not eating the same foods every single day, one that includes a variety of, of mic macronutrients, including carbohydrates, proteins, and fats, and one that's sustainable, that you can keep for the rest of your life. So many more questions for you, Kara, but we are going to take a break and do our trivia question. Folks, if you answer tonight's question, you'll get our wonderful guide to simple, healthy snacks created by our dietitian. If you want some new ideas for nutritious snacks that will keep you full, then you'll really enjoy this guide and you will get it for free if you answer tonight's trivia question, which is, true or false, type two diabetes is the most common type of diabetes. Is that true or false? Is type two the most common type of diabetes? Put your best guess in the comments and you'll get those snack ideas delivered to your Facebook Messenger inbox. And folks, if you can think of any friends or family members who might find this show helpful, please tag them in the comments so they can tune in too. Kara, we got a whole bunch of questions from people on our Facebook page who have specific food questions for you, so let's go through those now. Tabitha asked for suggestions on what to eat to reduce her high blood sugar. What would you say to Tabitha? Well, I would ask her what she's currently eating. I would ask her what types of medication she's she's taking, when she's taking them. So there are a lot of different factors that could impact your blood sugars and cause them to be high or low. So I would just ask what food she's she's currently eating. And if she happens to be eating a lot of high carbohydrate foods or foods that contain carbohydrates, I would maybe, we could dive into that a little bit more and see if there's a way of balancing, balancing that with other foods that don't contain carbohydrates that wouldn't contribute to raising blood sugar. And maybe if there is a way to cut back on the quantity or the portion size of the high carbohydrate foods. I'm so glad you mentioned that because it's so easy to forget that food is just one part of the equation when it comes to blood sugar. You know, medications have an impact, exercise has an impact. How do you encourage the people that you work with to think about kind of all the things that can impact blood sugar? I think it's important to think of each of those things as a tool. So food is one tool that, you, that can help you manage your blood sugars. Exercise is another tool and taking your medications is another tool. 
But there's also tools such as having support from a diabetes educator, from your provider, from your family, having psychological support, and having just the right education. And so I think thinking of the, those three main components, food, exercise, and medication, as just tools that can help you manage your blood sugar. Gary also asked for suggestions on what to eat. He has type 2 diabetes and can't eat dairy because of his Crohn's. He also says he lives very far away from a grocery store and can't keep fresh vegetables on hand easily. Any thoughts for Gary? Well, it's unfortunate that he might not be able to have dairy because of his Crohn's. However, there's plenty of dairy alternatives out there. And I think it's thinking of what foods that he could choose to replace the dairy, such as other foods that are high in protein that have some fat, so maybe some plant-based foods such as nuts or seeds. Um, so while it's hard to completely not be able to have one type of food, there are plenty of alternatives that, that he could find. As far as not being, not being close to a grocery store, what you could do is you could make a list of certain foods. When, when you go to the grocery store, try to stock up on things that aren't as perishable, such as whole grains or canned beans, even canned vegetables. And then also thinking about if you have enough freezer space, perhaps looking into frozen fruits and vegetables or frozen, frozen meals that might not have as much sodium or that could be a good alternative to some of the fresher items. Larry has a very common question we hear a lot on the page. He says, can I safely drink alcohol? Yes. So alcohol can actually lower blood sugar, and that's probably where the safety question comes in. So when we drink alcohol, it's metabolized in our liver, and it stops our liver from sending out glucose or blood sugar when we need it. And so that's why it's important to think about what type of alcohol you're drinking, because if you're drinking something like just a a straight spirit like vodka or gin, um, that won't have any any blood sugar raising effect, and that could that could help or that could actually lower your blood sugar if you're not eating anything with it. Um, other types of alcohol can actually raise your blood sugar in the moment. So if you're drinking something like a sugary margarita or um, cranberry with your mixed spirit, or even some higher alcohol beers can have a blood sugar raising effect. Um, so that's, those are, those are things you want to think about when you, when you're drinking, it's always safe to have your alcohol with some type of food, some type of meal or snack, make sure you don't drink on an empty stomach. And also just think about trying to be responsible in terms of the quantity that you're drinking, which is one drink a day for women and two drinks a day for men. Ah, oh, that's so helpful. Kevin asks, I'd be interested in your thoughts on taking vitamin D or fiber supplements to help manage blood glucose levels. Yeah. So in terms of vitamin D, I think that it, it it's the, the research doesn't show any kind of direct link to lowering or managing your blood sugar levels. However, it is important to take a vitamin D supplement, especially if you live in a climate that's that's darker, that's colder, and you're not getting as much sunlight. Um, and, and there are studies that show that people who have higher vitamin D levels tend to have maybe better management of their diabetes or lower incidence of diabetes. So there's no, there's no direct link to by taking vitamin D and lowering blood sugar, but I think it's it's some, definitely something you want to talk to your provider about in terms of taking that as a supplement. As far as fiber goes, I think it's important to get your fiber through your food intake. You could certainly take a supplement, but I'm not sure if that will be this have the same health benefit as if you were just to eat foods that are high in fiber, because when you eat those types of foods, they're generally going to be um, foods that have a lot of nutrients that help to stabilize your blood glucose levels because it prevents having a spike. So I think it's always better to get your fiber from your food versus a supplement, unless you're actually having trouble going to the bathroom, in which case um, that might be something you'd want to talk to your doctor about. Oh, great answer. Sampath asks, any diet tips for lowering fasting blood sugar, which is around 150? Any thoughts on kind of fasting blood sugar specifically and, and food choices we might make? Yeah, so often you could look at what you're eating at nighttime, the night before you wake up. So what time are you eating your last meal? What are you eating for your meal? Because that could have an impact on, on what your blood sugar is when you wake up. If you're eating, for example, like a, a high fat meal that contains carbohydrates like pizza, and you eat it maybe a couple hours before you go to sleep, that can have an impact of keeping your blood sugar high throughout the night and it could it could cause your blood sugar to be higher in the morning. So I think it's just looking at what are what time are you eating at night and what exactly are you eating. 
Another idea is if you if you're eating a moderately lower fat meal, say chicken with a salad and some brown rice at say six o'clock at night, then you're likely and your blood sugar is high in the morning, then maybe you could try even having a snack a couple hours before you go to bed. Um, a snack that contains some fat, some protein, so something like a Greek yogurt with some nuts and seeds and some berries. Um, and oftentimes that might help you, your blood sugar kind of be stable in the morning because it prevents um, what might be known as the Samoji effect where sometimes your blood sugar can dip low and then have a rebound effect in the morning and be high. Um, so those are some things you could look into. Uh, a lot of times it might just be that you need to du double check with your provider what, how your medication is working. You might need to make some adjustments with your medication. Great point. Gary asks, how many carbs should I aim for for each meal and snack? So it really is individualized based on how active you are, uh, what your current goals are in terms of if, you're maintain if you want to maintain your calories and your weight. Um, so a lot of a lot of factors can play a role in that, but in general, we recommend just a very broad terms around like 45 to 60 grams of carbohydrates per meal. And what does that look like? It's about like a cup, a heaping cup of brown rice, or a um, a sweet potato, a small sweet potato, or you know maybe a cup of a little over a cup of pasta. So another way to look at it is trying to visualize your plate and fill half of your plate up with non-starchy vegetables, so foods that don't contain many carbohydrates, a quarter of your plate with a protein source like chicken or fish or a lean, lean red meat, and then the other quarter of your plate be your carbohydrate food or your starchy food. So and if, you, if you aren't going to measure things out to get the exact number of carbohydrates, but you don't have to, it's good to visualize the plate method to, to visualize your portions. And then for snacks, if you wanted to, uh, I would suggest aiming for around 15 to 20 grams of carbs for a snack. So that's usually what is in the amount of like a, a nut bar or a Greek yogurt or a small piece of fruit. So I would just aim for those quantities for snacks and meals. So Cindy asks if you have any quick, healthy snack ideas for someone with type 2. So for snacks, I think it's important to think about why you're eating the snack. Is it just to hold you over to, to your next meal? Is it out of, are you eating it in between your meals or are you eating it after in the evening? In general, I think it's important for snacks to just be a, a controlled amount. Um, and so just some some ideas for quick and easy snacks could be a Greek yogurt with some nuts and seeds and berries. It could be like an apple, a small apple with peanut butter. It could be even a slice of toast with almond butter and some seeds on it. I think it's important to, to have the carbohydrate amount be around 15 to 20 grams, but make sure that you include a source of protein or fat. In case you're just joining us, we're here with dietitian and diabetes care and education specialist, Kara Schrager, who is answering questions about type two diabetes and food. And we're giving away our guide to healthy snacks created by our dietitian. If you answer tonight's trivia question, which is true or false, type two diabetes is the most common type of diabetes. Is that true or false? Put your best guess in the comments and you will get those fun snack ideas delivered to your Facebook messenger inbox. Kara, you've shared some great suggestions for folks who had specific questions about food. For anyone who wants to try to eat healthier, how do you suggest people make changes in their eating habits? Like we know people who try to change everything at once usually get discouraged and give up. What do you recommend? I recommend making a list of, of things they would like to change and thinking about how to make each, each item on that list as specific as possible. And then just start out with one. Just start out with one thing, because I think it's easy to be easy to want to change everything, but it's important to just make small changes little by little. So make one specific change, whether it's I want to I want to eat more vegetables. So how are you gonna how how can we make that a little more specific? Maybe say I'm going to have carrots and hummus as a snack, on you know once or twice a week. So something like that. Try to think of it. Try to think of something you want to make a change to and then try to make it as specific as possible and then just do one thing at a time. And then once you're used to that, maybe, maybe tackle another change on the list. Carol, we know that everyone has a unique health situation and different foods affect different people differently. How do you suggest someone figure out which foods and meals are best for them? I think it's important to see what, what foods that you enjoy eating, what foods you eat more often, 
and in what quantities. And then just test check your blood sugar one to two hours later to determine if you're in your target goal or your target blood sugar range, which would be for two hours after a meal, less than 180 milligrams per deciliter. I think it's important to choose and eat the foods that you enjoy that fit with your family, that fit with your culture, but to check to see how it impacts your blood sugar later on. And in some cases, you might need to make adjustments on the quantity or the portion size of the specific food, or in some cases, it might mean you need to increase your medication depending on what, what way you decide to go. And is there anything else we should be looking at in terms of figuring out if one food is a better choice over something else? Like, should we be looking at our cholesterol? Should we be thinking about whether it's ultra processed? Is there more to the equation than just blood sugar? There certainly is. I think it's it's figuring out what your health goals are. Do you have do you have other other conditions that you have to pay attention to, such as high blood pressure or high cholesterol? Um, and what foods can contribute to raising raising those conditions? So. If you're, if you're trying to lower your overall cholesterol, it's important to cut back on foods that have a lot of saturated fat. Um, and so that's just another factor you want to be aware of. If you have high blood pressure or hypertension, you want to be cutting back on foods that are high in sodium. So it might seem like a lot of things and a lot to balance, but I think it's, it's prioritizing what foods you enjoy and then coming up with the right amount of each food that would help with some, some other conditions you might have. So the glycemic index is one of those things that people with diabetes hear a lot about, but it can seem pretty confusing. Tell us what the glycemic index is and why it matters. So the glycemic index is based on a scale of 0 to 100. So foods that have a high glycemic index are higher on the scale. So for example, a food that has a high glycemic index is something like a fruit, like watermelon. A watermelon or all fruit in general is very healthy for us. It just means that it gets converted into glucose more quickly and more rapidly than some other carbohydrate containing foods that might have a lower glycemic index, such as beans. So it's important to look at the glycemic index, take it with a grain of salt, because it's actually very individualized based on, based on you. So what might spike someone's blood sugar in terms of having a high glycemic index effect on one person might be have a totally different impact on somebody else. So that's why it's important to check your blood sugar one to two hours after eating a certain food to determine what type of response it has on your on your own individual blood sugar. Um, other things can impact glycemic index, so how the food is prepared. So some, for example, cooking pasta longer can raise the glycemic index of, of pasta versus if you have it, eat it al dente. Um, the other other forms of food, so so drinking uh, orange juice will have a higher glycemic index than eating an actual orange. So some foods that you might think are very similar can have a different impact based on the actual form of the food. And then also what else you're including with that specific carbohydrate food. So if you have something like um, a slice of white bread, that's going to have a higher glycemic index than a slice of whole wheat bread. But if you're also including some turkey and cheese and lettuce and tomato on the bread, that's going to have a different impact than if you were just to have the bread by itself. So there's a lot of different factors on, on glycemic index. But the biggest thing is to make sure you check your blood sugar after eating that food to see what is the response in your body. So do you recommend that people look at food labels? And if so, what on a food label should a person with diabetes pay attention to? I certainly think it's important, if anything has a label, to look at it. The first thing I like to recommend is looking at what is the serving size? Is it the whole entire package? Is it a half a package? Is it a cup, a quarter cup? And that will determine the rest of the nutrition information. The next thing you want to look at is the total carbohydrates. Um, a lot, it's, it's pretty confusing because there's a lot of information on the label. So as far as it relates to your diabetes, the total carbohydrates is what will turn into glucose in our body. So underneath the carbohydrates, you have fiber, you have maybe added sugars, you might have starches. So just look at the total carbohydrate grams, and then you, what you can do is subtract the fiber. So if it has 30 grams of carbohydrates and 5 grams of fiber, you know that 25 grams will turn into glucose in your body. Um, and so based on the serving size, that food has 25 grams of carbohydrates. If the food has, you know, the more fiber the food, in my opinion, the better. Um, and then also looking at, does this food have some added sugar to it? If it has 30 grams of carbohydrates and most of them are, are from added sugars, it might be something you, you want to um, determine 
if, is that the right choice for you? Or is it, is it something if you really want it, that's okay. Maybe just stick to the serving size or maybe cut back on the serving size that's on the label. But it's definitely important to look at label. If anything has a label, I would just double check it. Kara, thank you so much for being here with us tonight. This has been such an informative conversation. Thank you so much for having me. And it's been a pleasure. And a big thank you to everyone watching at home. We so appreciate you being here with us tonight. Before we go, here's the answer to our trivia question. True or false, type 2 diabetes is the most common type of diabetes. The answer is true. If you didn't get to answer the trivia question, but you'd still like that guide to healthy snacks, just leave a comment for us and tell us what you thought of tonight's show. We will be back with a new episode in a few weeks. Until then, please stay safe and take good care. Good night.